Federal Relations and International Insurance Committees. And uh, I appreciate everybody that's coming here. I would like legislators on the phone on, under the Zoom program, would they introduce themselves? Any legislators on? I saw a couple. Will you guys introduce yourselves? On the Zoom? Yes. Uh, Neil Breslin, uh, Senator from uh, New York State. Uh, my district includes the capital of Albany. Okay. Any other legislators on the phone? Yeah, uh, Senator Tim Seward, also from New York. Yeah, very good. Welcome. Anybody else? California Assemblymember Ken Cooley in the suburbs of the Capitol. Yep, and I appreciate it. My co-sponsor among the later committee. Representative Edmund Jordan in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Welcome. Anyone else? I appreciate those and we'll continue. Yeah, for, for, the, uh, for the people here, I need a motion that we waive the quorum. So it's been moved and seconded. Seconded, yeah. <clears throat> appreciate it. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, we've waived the quorum. Uh, next thing I want to do is, would everybody review the minutes of the last meeting? And if there's any, please speak up if there's any corrections or addition to the minutes from the last meeting. If not, can I have I don't a know. motion that we accept the minutes? So again, move move. accepted. And, and, and second. Second. Nice. Senator Breslin, thank you. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Okay. So now we're going right down to our agenda. Uh, the first discussion for the Joint Federal Relations and International Insurance Committee. The first discussion is on Europe's insurance regulatory response to COVID-19. Uh, on Zoom, we should have Matt Brewis, who's the Director of General Insurance and Conduct Specialist with the FCA, the Financial Conduct Authority. Are you on, sir? I am. Good evening. Good afternoon. Okay. It is, is all yours, and we will shut up and listen. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much for uh, inviting me here uh, this evening. Um, I, b I believe that what uh, we were intending to do was to go through a number of kind of uh, questions and to allow you time to ask uh, anything you, you wish to about uh, what we are doing uh, here in the UK and Europe. But um, uh, I'm happy to speak if that's what you'd prefer. Okay, no, that'd be fine. That's fine. I just realized we're going to ask the questions from the start. So the first question that we're given to you, sir, is what, yeah. what role does the FCA play in regulating financial services firms in the UK? And how does this fit in with the roles of the PRA and the BOE? Sure. Um, so just to kind of an explanation of how it works here in the UK, the, uh, the Treasury uh, Department of the, of, uh, the UK government, uh, they uh, are our sponsors um they they uh, set the rules uh which uh, and the framework by which we the bank of england and the pra the potential regulatory authority uh regulate uh firms in the uk so the way it works for insurance companies is that the pra is responsible for the solvency so the capital the liquidity requirements of insurance companies and the fca are responsible for their conduct uh, in protecting consumers ensuring the markets work well uh, and so i'm responsible in the uk for about 600 insurers uh, about 7,000 insurance brokers um and that includes the Lloyd's market, as well as uh, just, you know, general retail selling to consumers directly. Thank you. Any follow up question from people on Zoom or anybody here? Any follow up on that first question? Thank you. The second question that I have is, how have the FCA addressed the challenges faced by the insurance industry and consumers during the coronavirus pandemic? Yeah. 
Thank you. So this is a this is a big question, and I think you know we we uh, this is one where I, I hope that we can have a bit of discussion about what we've done and, and uh, the kind of uh, things that you've been doing uh, in your states as well. So so firstly, the, one of the biggest challenges that our firms faced back in March was around operational resilience. They had to move from their big tower blocks in the city uh, with everyone to everyone working at home, and. For the most part, uh, all firms did that quickly. They did it safely uh, and managed to continue to provide a high degree of service to the customers that they uh, service. It's not without some teething problems. It wasn't without an increase in some risks uh, that were faced as a result of that, um, including you know IT issues and, th and things like that. But on the whole, uh, it was a real strong test of business continuity plans that firms had, uh, and they've worked surprisingly um, well. And uh, we have had a huge amount of engagement with firms to ensure that they continue to treat their customers fairly, that they continue to provide the services that they that they need to. Um, one of the other issues that obviously is the same for customers of insurers in the US as well as in the, as well as in the UK is that uh, because of the economic conditions, there have been uh, many thousands, millions of people who have lost their jobs uh, and have struggled to continue to make their payments. Uh, and at the FCA, we've done a huge amount around mortgage uh, holidays or, or deferrals to al to allow people at uh, that time to to allow them the safety of having their houses still, uh, but not having the concern around making payments during the, 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 the depths of the, of the pandemic. And in the insurance industry, one of the rules that we introduced quite early on was around deferral of a payment. So for many consumers in the UK, they pay on a monthly basis for their car, for their home insurance. And we introduced, um, well, we required firms to uh, either provide payment deferral to them uh, or to help them with the issues that they had. So for some, that may have been changing the contract that they had. For many people, their cars were sitting on the drive, not being used. Um, and what we saw in the UK was people just deregistered their car so they no longer needed to pay car insurance. Um, but we, we were trying to find ways to stop people needing to do that People still need their cars. They just weren't able to afford them. Uh, and so to assist with, with these kind of payment holidays and put that onus on firms to contact their customers who they understood to be in financial difficulties to assist them. And linked to that, we changed some rules around product value. So many people in the UK have insurance for their home uh, boiler, for their heating. Um, and as part of that, they may get insurance that allows them uh, an annual or biannual service of, of that um, under an insurance product. They were unable to make use of those uh, because you couldn't have people in your house in order to service the boiler. So what we, uh, what we have put the onus on insurers to do is say to them, if you cannot provide the product that people have purchased, you need to find a way of making sure they still get value. That may be extending the term of the policy. That may be provide a refund. Um, it would differ between customers. It would differ between products. But we required all firms to take action to make sure their consumers get value. Taking motor, for instance, and I know in some states, uh, you guys have had similar uh, questions and issues that you've done around this, where... Um, some firms have given like $20 refunds to all of their customers for their car insurance. And we've had some firms do that as well. But, but for me, um, the challenge has been saying to insurers, that's great, $20 for 20 pounds, uh, that's great. But what are you doing for those, uh, say, a young driver whose car insurance is £2,000, they have a beat up old car, all they use it for is to go to work, but they've lost their job. Um, how £20 is not going to help them. What are you going to do to make sure that that customer, uh, those vulnerable customers, uh, are still able to get value from the products that they've been sold? 
and and that's a really tricky question uh, it, it's different for for me compared to the guy down the road um everyone's going to have a different and so we've asked firms to think carefully about different customer segments and uh later this year they're going to have to report to us what they've done in order to ensure they've provided that value to their customers and then perhaps the biggest thing that you may have uh, heard about recently is we have taken uh, eight insurers to court over business interruption insurance um uh, i could talk for hours on business interruption insurance but just in summary uh, similar to issues, again, that I've seen uh, reported in the press uh, that, that you you've, uh, have had, we have um, taken action uh, because uh, many contracts were unclear. They weren't clearly defining whether or not they cover pandemics or not. They were silent on the issue. And a cold reading of those policies would suggest that actually, in, in our opinion, that they should cover business interruption. Uh, caused by uh, the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, many insurers disagreed with that. Uh, and as a result, uh, we took a, a court action to the High Court in the UK, uh, which we got the verdict last week. Uh, and what it found was, uh, it was mixed, but probably sl we, we won we feel we won more than we lost uh, on that. And uh, this is an uh, action that's going to affect 370,000 uh, business interruption policyholders. Um, that's thousands of uh, individuals as of small, medium sized uh, companies, um, kind of, you know, the backbone of the economy, the, the restaurants, the pubs, the people that employ it, so many people across the UK that we hope as a result of the action and as a result of the, uh, this case, that it will result in uh, some of those businesses being able to continue where otherwise they may not have done. Um, there you go. So uh, I'll stop there. Uh, very happy to take any questions on, on that. Yeah, and I, and I think we'll, pro we'll probably have some follow up. A question I have, and you touched on the, on the cycle or the issue of business interruption insurance. But when we talk to our carriers, the first thing the carriers say is they have it. There's no premium in there. You know, it's it's that condition is waived. And how can you cause a carrier to, to pay for something that they haven't charged a premium for? So what, what's your feeling on that? So so in the UK, there are two types of business interruption policies. There's property damage ones and non-property damage uh, uh, portfolios. The property damage ones are for in the event that a car, go, you know, you're, a, you're a restaurant, a car goes through your front window, you can't, you know, there's actual damage to your property. And we those policies don't work in this scenario. They don't pay out. There's no damage to physical property as a result of coronavirus. Um, that, that, that we could that we could work. I know there's been some attempts to say that it changes um, the a building at a microscopic level. Uh, we, we didn't run that argument. We, so really that covers about 90% in the UK of policies. So the action we took related to only really 10%-ish uh, of policies where there's non-damage. So a restaurant will have cover for that for in the event that uh, the chef gets salmonella and they need to close the restaurant. A nursery will have it in case there's an outbreak of measles. Um, and all of those policies uh, are the ones really that this potentially helps in the UK. Yeah. And I think you'll find you'll, you'll find similar in, uh, um, in your case as well. Yeah. The last question that I have is, is you know, the United States is a big is a big area, and, and we have a lot of different, like just even from Encore, we have people from all over the country. In in my state, Ohio, we, the healthcare people did, you know, really strong healthcare modeling of what we were going to face, and and they projected, and they pretty well closed down our hospitals, in that they projected thirty five thousand people would be admitted to the hospitals, and it's under two thousand. So the elect, you know, the healthcare monitoring that they did. Was it even close? And, and that was assuming that people wore masks, we did spacing, you know, that people followed safeguard standards. Oh, sorry about that. And so, so that's the question is, how was the modeling done in Great Britain? I mean, 
are you guys okay with how it was done and that have the numbers turned out to what you expected? Um, so, so I'm no, I'm no, I'm no uh, epidemiolo epidemiologist, um, and this is actually one of the issues that's fought quite hard in the, in the case, and is still one of those issues that uh, is still subject to debate even now, we, around the prevalence of the disease, um, and you know, in the same way as I understand it, in the US, the testing uh, regime has picked up considerably recently actually if you go back to march april may when all of these businesses closed uh there wasn't a regime and so the question is how do you determine how prevalent the disease was you can do hospital admissions as you say um it, and that that's one measure but but equally in the more rural parts of, of the country it's much more difficult to determine. And so one of the challenges that Your we still face and we're still trying to... Voice messaging system. So one of the problems we're still trying to solve right now uh, is, is a question about how do you determine how widespread COVID was in the UK uh, at, that, at that time? And there's lots of scientific evidence or conjecture. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's something that we're still working on. I'm afraid I don't really have a, a, an answer for that one for you at the moment. Okay, and I appreciate that. Uh, Matt. Thank you. Uh, Matt, I apologize. I, I came in uh, late. Maybe you already touched on this, but um, in, in the processing of all this, what did you go through? You, you made the decision to take this, this BI issue to court. Um, yeah. why, why did you feel that was the best route? Sure. So, so there were a number of things that I could have done that we could have done here. Um, we could have just made some rules to say, hey, you know what, we think these policies should pay out. Um, and this is what we think should pay out. And so do it. What would have happened then is the insurers would have taken us to court. And we, in the UK, we have a concept of a judicial review. I think you have something similar uh, in the US as well, where they would challenge whether or not we had the power uh, in order to, to do that. Um, and that would have taken quite a period of time. Uh, we could have, in the UK, we have um, something called the financial ombudsman, where individuals can take their complaints if they're unhappy with how they've been treated by their insurer, their bank, uh, any, any kind of finance provider. We would have come to the same issue in that situation as well, where if the insurers didn't like the outcome, they could have taken, they could have judicially reviewed the outcome. So we figured, let's skip to the back, but let's skip to the last page. This, this will end up in court. What can we do as quickly as possible that will, so, that will save kind of a whole load of work and then end up in court anyway, and saving uh, many individual companies. My, my whole aim here was about speed. Um, if we can, you know, for, for, for the UK legal system and the UK regulator to go from uh, launching this in uh, in April and having a verdict in September, I mean, frankly, that's unheard of in terms of speed. And uh, we we felt that you know speed was of the essence because of all these companies that could fail. So we um we we felt this was the best option for the the quickest route of getting that clarity. Thank you. Assemblyman Cahill. Uh, I, like Matt, apologize for coming in late. Uh, we're used to not starting on time, and this time we did. That threw us all off our game. <laughs> um, thank you for your, for your uh, participation here, and it's, it really is intriguing. This is the, one of the silver linings of everything that's happened to us, is that we're able to start thinking more broadly than the people we can drag to one of our meetings, and uh, this is a great opportunity. Um, I wish I, I was like there with you. Go on for hours about this interruption insurance and and the issues surrounding it because it is one of the most important uh, concerns of many of the people who reach out to our offices. What I would like to ask you specifically is, you said it was a mixed bag of uh, of uh, a decision. Can you sort of break that down a little bit? That's my first question, and the second question has to do. Uh, with those very few cases that I've come across uh, in our country and in our state, New York, um, that involve somebody who actually purchased 
pandemic business interruption insurance and invariably um, it was Lloyd's of London that was selling that. So I'm interested to hear if you know of any international uh, considerations in this realm as well. So the breakdown of your court decision and any international considerations that you've come across. Thank you very, thank you very much uh, for your question. And, and just to begin with, I'd say uh, if um, you know if you'd like to have me back anytime, I'd love to, to love to come over and, uh, uh, and speak in person with you. Um, so the, the the way we broke it down was we asked our lawyers to review six hundred different policy types. Frustratingly, there isn't one kind of common wording that's used there you know every firm has multiple and in some cases hundreds of different wordings of business interruption insurance so what we did was look at where the trends were what were the issues so uh, and we focused on uh, ones which we thought uh, the insurers had decided incorrectly there were some things we thought the insurers were right on in terms of how they're determined but uh, the issues we focused on were prevention of access so does the government say say saying you have to close? Does that mean you're prevented from accessing your building? Um, the insurers say yes, it means you can't access the building. Sorry, pardon me. The insurers say no, you can still actually go to your front door. You can still get in. You just can't open for for business. Um, so we we won on that uh, where the government forced people to close however one of the areas we didn't win was where the government suggested that people closed but didn't legally require them to so dentists in the uk as an example uh it was suggested they didn't open they were not mandatory mandat they, they weren't forced to close uh, and therefore they weren't covered uh the, the judgment was that they, that they weren't covered. Um, other, other cases uh, that were covered in this included issues around uh, if you had to have the disease on the premises uh, and that forced you to close for a long period of time, well, uh, we, we lost that one on the basis that you deep clean a building within a couple of days, you know, you might be covered for three days while you do that deep clean, but then it's gone. Um, so therefore, uh, that wasn't covered. And others, just looking at my list here, um, require, so others uh, required emergency local restrictions uh, to be imposed. So not a national restriction, but had to be something within uh, a small vicinity. It was something that we're actually we're seeing more now in the UK, more localized lockdowns as opposed to as opposed to national a national one. Make sure that I'm muted there. Get off my picture. Okay. And um, sorry, I, I I think you had another question, but I um, it's it's my, my second my mind. question is, was about whether you've had any experience with international consideration. Ah uh, yes. Um, so this covers policies written in the UK, irrespective um, of, so it was UK insurers uh, who, were, who were party to this case. It was around policies written in the UK. It's, it's possible that some of those policies were uh, written, underwritten in the UK, but, but were elsewhere. Um, and I'd be, I can look into that in more detail. Um, you can drop me a note uh, afterwards. I I, I, can, I I can look into that in more detail if that would be if that would be helpful. I would say one of the one of the key things that was discussed as part of this court case was um, a, a, a judgment. It's quite a famous judgment called the Orient Express, which you may have heard of. It's it's to do with a hotel in uh, New Orleans that was uh, damaged during Katrina, um, and the. Basically, what happened was uh, the business tried to claim on its business interruption to say, well, look, my, my place was damaged because of Katrina. Therefore, you need to pay me out for the business that I've lost. And the insurer said no. Uh, it went to court and the court ruled in favor of the insurer on the basis that um, Katrina was a wide scale event. It didn't just impact this hotel. So the fact that if, even if this hotel hadn't been damaged, it wouldn't have had any customers because of, of how the area was so uh, dramatically um, damaged. 
And so the corollary to this case is was saying, um, actually, what happened here is people weren't going out for dinner. You wouldn't have had any, but even if you were open, you wouldn't have had any business because people were scared of COVID and the government was telling people to stay at home. Um, now, this case, the judges in this case determined that that judgment, the, the, the Orient Express judgment, was probably incorrectly adjudicated by, by a previous court. Um, and so it leaves it open to further challenge in, in the future. Um, it, it's something that insurance lawyers are immensely excited uh, about as, a, as an issue. Um, I haven't done it justice in my description, but... Um, uh, some some of you may have heard of that case, and that's kind of it's quite an important part of what we've established as part of, as part of this um, test case that we've taken. Thank you. Uh, next question that I have is, excuse me, Matt. Okay, I have a couple more. It, I, I was gonna, just going to shift gears. Uh, sure. A much broader question. If you want to, if I can. Yeah, you go ahead. Yeah, so, uh, just uh, Matt. Just my my question kind of is along the line of. Um, as you are kind of the regulator of insurance in, in, in the UK, how has the, the, the coronavirus along with Brexit, kind of those two things going on in the UK, how's that meant, what's been the competitiveness of the UK market is in Europe as a whole? Thank you. It's, a, it's, an, it's an interesting question. I mean, th there's a huge amount we don't know about Brexit yet um despite it having gone on for over four years now uh but you know it looks like it's going to happen in three months one way one way or another and uh what what we've seen is over the last few years many insurers in the uk get ready for brexit by setting up european businesses by moving this some their kind of mainland europe business out of the uk and into europe setting up new legal entities um, it it doesn't change. It won't change how the FCA supervises in the UK. Uh, on day one, our rule book will be exactly the same as it is today, but there will be the opportunity for divergence in the future. So, uh, COVID hasn't changed how we are planning for Brexit. It hasn't changed our approach uh, and uh, the rules that we have put in place and the expectations on firms. Um, but obviously, you know, the double whammy uh, of the two uh, and is going to make it um, an interesting period. But the many insurers, we, we've, we believe and we've been talking with them about it for years now, uh, feel that they're ready for Brexit. They've moved the business they need to. And so uh, in some ways, um, it ha it shouldn't be as tricky, as difficult as it may have been uh, if if this was kind of a year or two previous. So and maybe a follow up to that is when you said they're they're moving kind of moving the businesses out. Who who is the beneficiary of that uh, are they going to where in in Europe? Uh, different places. Um, there there depends on uh, you know we have some insurers that are that are domiciled elsewhere in Europe and happen to branch into the UK or have big operations here. So they were already kind of relatively well set up. Um, but uh, in the main, um, you know, the big insurance hub is in Europe, of Paris, of um, Amsterdam, of Frankfurt, um, were uh, obviously pretty attractive. Um, and we're seeing the same, you know, it's not just in uh, insurance, it's in, in other industries as well. We're seeing more onshoring into into Europe as people uh, and firms split their business between the two. Um, obviously, for you know, uh, companies like Lloyd's, uh, the Lloyd's market, London market, uh, is a really kind of key part of the UK infrastructure here. And so um, we're working very closely with, with Lloyd's uh, as well as as well as the whole London market and understanding the impacts and how we can um, uh, ensure that they can continue to operate as as well as they always have done um, and provide that uh, have that constant conversation to make sure that uh, the UK is it remains a competitive place for these uh, businesses to operate. I think we have time for one more question. I have one, and it really follows up what Matt just asked. Has there, has there been any change from the FCA with the Brexit advice for firms and consumers 
as a result of the pandemic, uh, pandemic and, the, and, and the Brexit happening? Changing it all? I um, so our Brexit plans, of, of, you know, m most of it is reliant on uh, the the uh, free trade agreements or any other agreements that are made uh, by the government. We, we have, all firms are prepared for various different types of Brexit, depending on what deals are agreed with with uh, with Europe. Um, and and firms, you know, we've had three or four times now where we've almost got to the point of Brexit. Firms are well practiced at walking up that hill of getting everything operationally ready. Um, so. So the COVID overlay is a is a difficult one um, to to kind of add into the mix, but but in terms of uh, everything around Brexit, that's pretty well uh, set for most firms. Uh, the the coronavirus response is in parallel, and you know as as I as I've said throughout, our our focus is on consumers. It's on SMEs. It's ensuring that they are have the services and that they're well protected uh, from any insurance that's written in the UK, no matter where uh, they are that the, the business is carried out, and and that continues to be the driving focus of me and my team uh, at the FCA. Thank you. Matt, we want to take this minute. May, may I just add, uh, finally, um, sorry, you, my, my email address is on, the, is on the invite. If there are follow-up questions that people have or com any issues, questions around business interruption in the case, my colleagues and I are more than happy to, um, to, to help. And I, I've spoken to uh, kind of a, a number of either you or your colleagues uh, over the last few months about, about our action and very happy to continue to do so if that's of any uh, interest. Yeah, and I appreciate that. I want the people in the room know it's a five hour difference. So it's between eight and nine o'clock there in Britain. And so we really appreciate you joining us today. So thanks again for joining in, Coy, and we appreciate you did a great job. Thank no you. problem, thank you. Uh, the second and last uh, topic is, is the federal response to Dynamex discussion on US Department of Labor employee classification regulation. And the first one that we have on Zoom is James A. Preddy. Junior, he's a shareholder with Littler Mendelssohn PC. Mr. Peretti, are you on? We hope I'm you. on and I am unmuted, so I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, good afternoon, it's a, a pleasure to speak with everybody today. Sounds like we're across the country and around the world. Uh, I'm gonna try to share my screen, so I've got a few short slides. Bear with me for a second, we'll see if that works. <laughs> Um, sorry, stick with me for one second. And that does not appear to be working for me. Sorry, just one more moment if we can do this, we can. If not, I will proceed without the slides and we can perhaps get them sent around to you. There we go. Let's put this in the slideshow mode if we can. All right. Uh, I hope everybody is seeing what I've put up there. It's uh, I don't have a, a long deck today, but I thought it would be easier to just walk us through and put a few things on the screen. Um, <clears throat> my name is Jim Peretti. I'm an attorney with Littler Mendelssohn, a shareholder in our Washington, D.C. office. Uh, a member of the firm's Workplace Policy Institute, and WPI is sort of our uh, regulatory focus. While my practice is some traditional labor and employment work, I do a lot of work in the regulatory area, including comments, strategic litigation, some things we'll talk about today. Um, I've been asked to discuss the Department of Labor's final rule on joint employer status under the Fair Labor Standards Act. Uh, but before we turn to that, I think it's important to sort of unmuddy the waters because, and I know those of you who are serving in the legislatures probably have seen this as well. Um, there are two issues that often seem to get 
muddled here for lack of a better word. Um, one is, is an employee, is a given worker properly classified as an employee or an independent contractor? Um, and there's been a lot of activity in the States, most notably in California with AB5 um, around dictate sort of structuring that question of whether a given worker is an employee with the protections of all the wage and hour laws, other state labor laws, or whether they are an indep independent contractor. Uh, and the issue is often put as one of misclassification, is the employee misclassified? What we're gonna immediately talk about today is something slightly different, which is joint employer status under the Fair Labor Standards Act. Um, I stress it's under the FLSA because the NLRB and the National Labor Relations Act has its own set of rules. Uh, the EEOC that's expected to, is expected to promulgate a rulemaking shortly on this. Um, IRS uses its own test. But the question here is whether someone is a joint employee, meaning there's no question that they are a W-2 employee of one, an employer. The question is whether there is a second or other employers uh, to whom uh, that, that employment relationship exists. So for years, it's been, you know, there've been a multiplicity of tests uh, varying from circuit to circuit. Uh, the Department of State had its own test for whether determining someone was a joint employer. Uh, so beginning last in 2019 and finalized in January of this year, DOL set forth a final rule for determining when an employee of one company might be held to be also employed by uh, the second company, the joint employer in this scenario. Uh, and DOL put forth a four-part test. Um, it's a balancing test. No single factor is uh, dispositive of the equation, but essentially it looks to a lot of what the common law of employment was and, and just clarifies and brings a little more certainty to it. Uh, and really in determining whether an employee, one employer is the joint employer of another entity's employees, they're gonna look to see if that putative joint employer has hires or fires the employee in question, um, supervises and controls the employee's work schedule or the terms and conditions of their employment to a substantial degree, uh, whether that joint putative joint employer determines the employee's rate and method of pay, um, and finally the fourth factor, whether that employer maintains um, employee employment records, and that certainly comes into question when you have you know, staffing agencies and things of the sort. Um, as I said, the test makes very clear no single factor is dispositive. Um, they did get into the, uh, they did make clear that the fourth factor, that maintaining employment relationships, if that is the only one of the boxes that is checked, then you are, uh, that is that is on its face going to be insufficient. It may be in combination with other factors probative of joint employer status, uh, but merely the maintenance of employment records as they're defined under the reg is going to be uh, insufficient. Um, secondly, I think perhaps even more important, uh, the final rule clarifies that when you're looking at these factors, that joint employer must actually exercise directly or indirectly uh, one of those control factors. Uh, a significant issue over the years in litigation has been, well, the employer has contractually reserved the right. I reserve the right to fire my subcontractors' employees or my franchisees' employees. Uh, but as a practical matter, that, that right was never exercised. Similarly, you know, prescribing codes of conduct, codes of behavior, if the contractual right was reserved, uh, there are some courts that have said, well, you know, that under the common law test would be sufficient to get you joint employer status. Uh, Department of Labor's regulation makes clear that that's not the case, and they're going to look really at the actual, is the control being exercised directly or indirectly? So certainly direct is easy enough to understand. Indirect is, you know, even if it's being done through you know, a, a cat's paw or, you know, a third entity, if, if that joint employer is making those, those decisions or those calculations, um, that's going to weigh in favor of a joint employer finding. Um, the rule establishes that there are additional factors that may be relevant. Uh, Please, you may have access that window. Okay, I will. I will. Yeah, that's whatever you are free. Uh, uh, the final rule lays out that there are additional factors to which the department may look in terms of determining whether there is a joint employment relationship. Um, also, it makes clear and identifies that certain business models do not make joint employer status more or less likely. Um, and I'll tell you candidly, I think that was intended to get to the franchise model where we've increasingly seen, um, you know, as a member of the defense bar, we see a lot of cases where 
uh, the employees of a, of a franchise restaurant are suing the owner of the franchise saying, you know, you owe me overtime or it was, you know, wage, wage and hours were properly calculated. I wasn't given my meal and rest breaks. Um, but in addition to suing the owner of the franchise itself, they are then suing the, fr the national franchisor uh, on the theory that it's a deeper pocket. Um, and the, the argument that they tend to pursue is that, well, because franchises are such a structured business relationship, that national franchisor at the top really is exerting control on these employees down here, notwithstanding that there, you know, there's never a question that there was a W-2 employment relationship between the two. So the bill makes clear that franchising is not in and of itself indicative of or more likely to result in a joint employer finding. Uh, similarly, rule provides that if your terms and conditions relating to employment, such as subconstitute requiring your subcontract to have sexual harassment policies, to be compliant with you know local laws and all you know all permits and things of that sort, that's not going to increase the likelihood of a joint employer finding. Uh, finally, they include a number of uh, excuse me, examples, applying the four-factor test. You know, they're, they're good, but as usual, when you see regulatory examples, they tend to be the easier cases rather than the hard one. Um, but I think the principles you draw for them can be distilled. So that's where we stand or where we stood up until around a month ago, which probably before, um, before we even had booked this call, we, would, we were going to talk about, okay, this is important to discuss the Department of Labor's final rule. This is the rule we're now operating under. Well, uh, back in May, a coalition of states attorney generals um, representing, uh, I think, uniformly uh, Democratic states or Democratic states attorney generals um, sued the Department of Labor to challenge its rule under the Fair Labor Standards under the Administrative Procedures Act. Uh, they claimed it was arbitrary and capricious. It departed from prior precedent. Um, it's insufficiently grounded in the language of the FLSA itself, which is, you know, has been traditionally read broadly and fairly protectively. Um, and in September, just the beginning of the month, uh, the case is New York versus Scalia. I've got the site up on the screen there. Uh, the district court vacated the, the applicable parts of the regulation dealing with vertical joint employment. Um, now, full disclosure, my firm Littler, we actually represent a group of trade associations who have uh, in, who intervened in the lawsuit, lawsuits so that they could bring you know, the interests of the business community to the table. Uh, because when it was you know, the Department of Labor, they're, they're tasked with upholding their rule, but it's not their job to represent the interests of businesses or employers or any you know, individual. They, they have the law. That's, that's their job. So we did intervene on their behalf. So we are parties to this case. So I'm not going to get into too much detail on it. Um, the site is up there. It's available for you to take a look at. Um, at to, the, to date, the Department of Labor has not made clear whether it will appeal the district court's decision, uh, whether it will attempt to publish a new rule or take another route. So while at <clears throat> when we booked this call, we were saying, okay, we're going to talk about the regulations that are now in effect. Given that this was, you know, 18 states and the court was fairly clear that it was a broad injunction, uh, we're back to where we sort of started from square one, at least until this is decided on appeal, which is you're back to looking at the case law in your particular circuit. What are the balancing tests that are being applied? Um, and what, you know, what sort of precedent and common law uh, case law bears on the question? Um, so with that, recognizing we're a little bit close on time, and I, I think we have until four, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague. Uh, I think it's Joe who's going to present a bit, and I hope we can leave a few minutes for questions at the end. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Next one to speak is Joe Capurro, who's president of the California Applicants Attorney Association. Yeah, I have to, I have to make a slight disclaimer. Uh, I so um, I have earned the title of past president, media past president of the California Apple Attorney Association, a title I'm happy to hold. Um, so I'm, I am going to talk about misclassification of employees as independent contractors, uh, particularly in the context of uh, Dynamics, which is a, a, a fairly celebrated case here in California and the follow on legislation um, that came out of that case. Um, Misclassification of employees is not, a, uh, as independent contractors, not a new problem, um, but it has, um, because of increasingly complex uh, employment arrangements, um, become a, a, an issue of uh, recent in, uh, concern, um, which ultimately led to the court's decision in Dynamex, um, or Dynamics. 
it's it's pronounced either way here in the state in California. But it, yeah, I was waiting for you, Joe. Tell me, I, I, I'm I'm in Washington, so I've I've been saying it wrong, I think. But which what's what's you're the so, authority? Um, I, I spoke to somebody who actually participated in the oral argument, um, and he says it's dynamics. Um, is the correct pron pronunciation. Um, so before before dynamics, uh, the standard was uh, for determining employment um, was uh, what was called the control of work test, um, the right to control the manner and means of accomplishing the desired result of the activity. Um, and when making that determination, uh, the, the court in the Supreme Court in the Borello case said there were essentially nine sub factors that needed to be looked at. I'm not gonna go through all of them now because of time constraints, but things like the right to discharge the employee, what, what was the pay arrangement, um, who supplied tools, uh, whether this required special skills and what the beliefs of the party were with regard to the arrangement. Um, and it was a factual standard, no one factor controlled um, and decisions were hard to reconcile, frankly, under that standard. Um, in dynamics, in dyna dynamics, dynamics, sorry, um, the, uh, this involved a, a, a day delivery service, um, which had previously had its uh, drivers be employees and at one point changed its policy and um, offered them all the opportunity to become independent contractors um, and work on that status. Um, the, the question became one of, uh, of um, overtime and wage and hour issues that went to the uh, court of uh, the Superior Court in Los Angeles. Um, so the, the case is dy uh, Dynamics Operations West versus Superior Court of Los Angeles. Um, the site is 4 Cal 5th 903. It's a, nine, it's a 2018 case. Um, and the court said that with regard only to wage and hour, and that's important, the Supreme Court limited its decision to wage and hour issues and said they weren't um, necessarily applying a new standard with regard to other issues, including my area of practice, workers' compensation. Um, but they said that they were shifting from that Borello test to a simpler, more straightforward um, test referred to as the ABC test because there are three elements. Um, whether the worker is free from control and direction of the hire in connection with the performance of the work, both under the contract and in fact, um, whether the worker performs work that is outside the usual course of, of the hiring entity's business, and whether the work, worker is customarily engaged in, independently, in an independently established trade, occupation, or business of the same nature as the, as the work performed. So that's the three elements of the ABC test that the court adopted with regards regard to wage and hour issues in the state. Um, following the case, there was a lot of um, commentary about what the actual decision of the case was um, and whether e either the sky was falling for employment relationship in California or whether this was a wonderful decision um, which provided substantial new protections to the worker um, there were some follow-on cases, um, one involving a, a franchise janitorial service, um, which uh, applied uh, dynamics and found that uh, they weren't truly uh, uh, franchisees, they were employees. One involved uh, a, a taxi cab driver um, who drove for a company that controlled 90% of the taxi market in the area. Um, in both cases, there was findings. Um, that led to um, the introduction of several pieces of legislation um, in the California legislature, some trying to undo uh, the Supreme Court's decision, some uh, trying to uh, codify it and, and uh, expand on it. Um, and the result was AB5, um, legislation by, Lorena Gonzalez, by uh, Assemblywoman Lorena Gonzalez, which did in fact codify um, the decision um, and applied it as to all labor issues, not just wage and hour issues. So now in California, um, the ABC test is, is the standard test. However, within the legislation, um, a number of uh, industries were exempted 
um, and still operate under the Borello test. Um, so there's likely still to be some confusion. One industry that did not um, participate in the legislative process seeking um, uh, relief from the ABC test was the app-based drive share, drive ride sharing and uh, delivery service industry, um, the, the, the gig economy. Um, they've gone a different way. They've uh, proposed uh, Proposition 22, um, which would for the first time create a presumption of independent contractor status within that industry. Um, that's kind of a quick summary. I'm gonna stop there because of time and allow for questions. Thank you. Listen, I, I appreciate uh, uh, your words, et cetera. Any questions from the group? Yes, Matt, Matt Lehman. Thank you. Um, just kind of the question, I guess, I'd, you've said what the verdict was or what the case was and, and everything else, but, but what's gonna be, what do they estimate the impact to be? If all these independent contractors are now my employees, that's going to affect my workers' comp. Is that going to affect my employment practices liability? What's it going to do to the uh, to the employment agencies, the PEOs? How, what's going to be the end result of all this? When this all hits the, uh, the, the employer. Um, obviously, I don't have a crystal ball. Um, given the number of exceptions, um, many industries are going to continue to operate the same way. For instance, real estate brokers are exempted. Um, that's an industry that uh, typically um, identifies the broker as an independent contractor. Uh, hairdressers and barbers are part of the exempted class. Again, very typical in that industry to um, have uh, the provider of service rent the chair from the owner of the salon. Um, thus far, we haven't seen uh, a lot of, um, the sky is not falling. Um, businesses are going to go on. And the, and the law does not prohibit an independent contractor relationship. That's quite clear that it does not do that. It, what it prohibits is the misclassification of an employee. So if you're, if you're a hirer and you want to treat somebody as if they're an employee, um, you can't call them an independent contractor. That's basically what the law provides. So my follow-up to that is you gave the example of the janitorial. So I, I go out and I contract with, with 10 people to come in and clean my office and I'm gonna pay them you know, 15 bucks an hour to do that because that's all I'm paying is $15. I'm not paying any unemployment. I'm not paying any workers comp. And now they all have just become my employer, my employees. I got an added janitorial class to my work comp. That's gonna be a $3 rate. I've got a couple of grand. How do I continue to pay $15 an hour and make that work? Are we going to see a, a, a fallout of that being is I'll, I'll, I'll hire somebody else. So you know, the, I know the sky's not falling, but I think there's it's setting up for pieces of the sky to fall. Correct. Yeah. That's, that is a significant uh, concern that was expressed during the process. The, the answer is if your business is not to provide janitorial service, you can hire a janitor as an independent contractor. If as a lawyer, I don't, if I have a janitor come in and clean my office, I don't have to have that person be my employee. I may choose to have that person be my employee, but having my office cleaned is not an essential part of my job, of my work. So that person does not have to be an independent con or an employee under the AB5 standard. Um, I, I, Joe, if I, if I can jump in, I, I think to some extent, I, I would agree with you. I, to some, we probably differ on the margins on some others. Um, you know, as you mentioned, AB5, which was the law that was uh, enacted last September, had a number of exceptions included in it. Um, there was significant, you know, sort of public discourse after the bill was passed. There were a number of folks that were concerned. Freelance writers, for example, and performers were very concerned. Uh, so, just in the last legislative session, uh, they passed. They included an additional number of exceptions to the AB5 test. So you're back under that original Borello test. You're no longer under the ABC. I think the point Joe was getting to is that, you know, of the three factors in the test, there's control and there's that B prong, which is difficult because the B prong says you're doing something that is different 
you're not in the the contractor is not in the normal course of your business so to use the example you gave a lawyer contracting with someone to clean the office is probably you know there's no argument that the lawyers is in the business of cleaning they're in the business of practicing law so the janitor is not in the same category i think where it starts to get more difficult is where you bring in folks to do certain work that's you know very closely related to what your enterprise is but not necessarily you know what is the business that you are in? Um, I am a bakery and I bake cakes and I do, but I wanna use contract deliverers. You know, I'm, I'm a baker and I offer delivery services to weddings, to venues, you know, things that with large parties. Um, you know, am I in the business of baking such that if I'm contracting with a delivery company and an independent contractor to be my driver, I'm, I'm free and clear, or is the court gonna look at it and say, well, no, you're, you're in the business of providing you know, delivered cakes to to all these things. You don't really have a storefront. So are, you know, how integral are they to your to your business? So I think it's that B prong that's gotten the most mucky. I suspect um, we're gonna continue to see uh, additional legislation or certainly additional proposed fixes. Um, but, you know, there was, a, at least in the, in the immediate aftermath, there were a number of, of reports of, for example, again, the freelancers where they had put a strict 35 cap in if you if you submitted more than 36 more than 35 articles to a given publisher you are no longer a freelance writer you were an employee of that publisher well a lot of them i think vox was the one that came immediately to mind said we're, we're not going to engage folks in california anymore because we don't want to run the risk of if you know someone miscounts now all of a sudden this person you know they were an independent contractor on their 35th article when they sent in the 36 they became an employee that was somewhat addressed in uh, AB 2257, which was the bill, the new set of amendments, um, but there's still a lot of unclarity there. So I'm, I'm gonna stop talking because I know we're limited in time and I don't know if there are other questions, but I think Joe, I agree with you on some and probably we disagree to dis agree to disagree on some others. Gonna be some close calls. Uh, in my industry, what I do, you know, we have an issue with regard to interpreters. If, if I have a monolingual, a non-English speaking client, um, and I need an interpreter, is that an essential part of my business or is that a, an outside service? It's a, it's a question that, that is gonna come down the road. Yeah, we have time for one more question and, it's, and we're gonna take it from Zoom. Uh, Assemblyman Ken Cooley is on the line and he has a question. Ken? Well, I was actually just gonna kind of a, add some color to this characterization of, we had the court decision, we had AB5, there has been efforts create new categories and refine the rule. I would say this issue became highly controversial in California. Everybody in their own profession that is any way has colleagues that they are organized around with in their profession got involved to raise the rancor of their political voice on being in or out. Truckers driving around the Capitol. We've mentioned the journalists. Uh, Every little imaginable group took umbrage at what the legislature had done, rewriting employment relationships if they're on that side or embracing it. Uh, and so we've got ballot propositions on the current ballot, Prop 22 that relates to uh, Uber and Lyft. Um, it's just a, and it is the case that we passed this rule with a series of cutouts, which included uh, insurance agents were excluded from the rule in the original bill. Um, but we keep coming back with other bills and it's even getting used on the level of, let's recall the governor because he signed AB5. There's, there's just a, quite an energy in this issue among different constituencies around California. Um, and one of the reasons we got the insurance agent cut out Funny little odd fact, but the only reference to agency in the California State Constitution concerns insurance agents. It is an obscure area of law dealing with retaliatory taxation, but nonetheless, for the longest time, we've had constitutional law dealing with uh, insurance agents. And that fact actually became something that helped early on push the author and in, in granted a cutout to insurance agency because they were not wanting to run afoul somehow of, of a constitutional rule that might cause an infirmity. Um, so uh, yeah, just this is an issue that has really riled up a lot of organized employment groups. Um, 
but uh, I they actually there was an information hearing done in the Capitol, strictly informational in the spring of 2019, and I think uh, it must have been six hours of nonstop testimony that you would characterize most of it as kind of highly vitriolic, just people very upset, three or four minutes of commentary, you know, one testimony after another. I actually sat through the hearing. I was the only legislator except for maybe the chair that was in the room the whole time just to watch how it unfolded. Thank you. Uh, I think we're running over. It's, it's past four o'clock. Uh, one point I'd like to make for those of you that are on Zoom and you dial in the phone without video, we only see the phone number and, and no name. So if you want to ask a question, please submit and identify yourself in the chat box. So once again, to the speakers, I appreciate you guys taking your time to be on Zoom. Uh, if you, any last minute, if you want to react to Ken, et cetera, I'll give you a few seconds, but keep it brief. I, I, I agree with the assemblyman. I think this is, this as with so many issues of labor and employment, this is it's very heated very quickly with a lot of, you know, a lot of strong arguments on both sides. So we'll see. We'll see what happens with the ballot proposition and, and we'll see what's going forward. But I, I agree. This is a, definitely a, a shirts and skins as so many of the labor and employment issues are. And with that, I thank you for the opportunity to speak. Hopefully next year we can all be in the same room and do this together. Thank you. Again, I just want to thank you all for uh, giving me the opportunity to come and, and speak as well. Thank you. Joe, thank, thank you. you. Uh, we're going to take. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Senator Vicki Sawyer and happy to call this meeting to order, which Will promises will be one of the shortest meetings of the entire weekend. So we'll see if Will will hold to his promise. So thank you all for being here for the Special Committee on Natural Disaster Recovery. Um, I'd like to call the meeting to order. And ask, first of all, to ask any legislators that are on Zoom to please identify themselves. No one wants to take credit for being on Zoom? They're all here. We're all here. Very good. Thank you so much, Chairman. All right. Then we'd like to, enter, the Chair would like to entertain a motion um, to waive a quorum. So move, Representative Fisher. Second. We're good. Thank you. So the quorum has been waived, and we're moving on to the minutes. We have two sets of minutes to approve. Uh, I have a chair entertain a motion to uh, adopt the minutes. Thank you, Representative Fisher. So moved. Second. Thank you. We do have a few comments from um, some folks that are on Zoom, I believe. I guess they didn't say that they were, but hopefully they'll, they'll be, a, or actually from Aaron and Frank, forgive me. But I do want to say some opening comments. Good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us. Um, I'd like to say a few very brief words uh, before we begin the final meeting of the NCOIL Special Committee on Natural Disaster Recovery. Um, as you know, this committee was formed last year at the direction of NCOIL President Louisiana Senator Blade Morsh for the specific purpose of developing model legislation that would facilitate the expansion of the private flood insurance model. And of course, my phone is having fun with me right now, of private flood insurance market and hearing presentations from experts as to how best to develop natural disaster recovery public policy. The formation of this committee was one of the major goals of his term at NCOIL president. And I am proud to say that after much hard work, the private primary residential flood insurance model act is ready for a vote. I have really enjoyed chairing the committee and I thank everyone who has served on the committee worked on the model and delivered presentations throughout the past year. That model is in your binder, binder starting on page 40. After hearing comments from legislators and interested parties, I will entertain a motion to adopt the model. So let's get started. Before we move to the two uh, speakers who are participating by Zoom, do any of the legislators have any comments? Great, thank you. Um, I'd like to hear first from Aaron Collins, representing the National Association of Mutual Insurance Companies. Aaron, are you there? Madam Chair, this is Aaron Collins from NAMIC. Uh, can you all hear me all right? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for having me even uh, virtually. Sorry, we can't be there with you in person. Uh, just want to take this moment to say uh, thank you to the chair and to the sponsor, as well as the committee members. Uh, as noted, this has been a uh, involved process to get to this uh, piece of legislation that we view as a very uh, collaborative piece of compromise legislation with a lot of stakeholder input. 
Uh, we think it represents a good measure for states to, to uh, start with and consider if they're trying to foster a private flood market. So uh, we thank you again, and we are supportive of the effort and would encourage the committee to move forward. And that's all. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you for your comments. Now moving on to Frank O'Brien, VP of State Government Relations, American Property Casualty Insurance Association. Thank you, Madam Chair. And in keeping with your desire to have this be the shortest meeting Thank of you. this committee on record, let me just say one word, ditto. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate the brevity. All right, now, if there, is there any other further discussion by legislators? We're good. We got a we got a thumbs up in the back. Our honorary legislator, I guess. <laughs> so um, the chair would entertain a motion to adopt the model. Representative Fetcher, all in favor? Ayes. The vote. Good. The ayes have it in voice vote. Thank you so much, and that concludes the shortest meeting of Incoil Summer Meeting. Thank you. Madam Chair. Good afternoon. Uh, we'll go ahead and call to order um, the summer meeting of the Property and Casualty uh, Insurance Committee. Uh, if we could have, we're not doing a formal roll call uh, today, but if we could have uh, <coughs> any legislators that are participating via Zoom, if you could identify yourself so we know that you're present. I, California. Oh. Go right ahead, Senator. Yeah, Senator uh, uh, James Seward from New York. Assemblyman Ken Cooley in California. Hey, Ken. Representative Peggy Mayfield from Indiana. Any other legislators on, on Zoom today participating? Uh, if not, I'll entertain a motion to waive the quorum today. I have a motion and a second. Second, yep. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. I also need... Okay, I also, I need a motion to approve both uh, the minutes of the March 6th, 2020 meeting and the July 24th, 2020 uh, interim committee meeting. I have a motion and a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Uh, very good. We'll get started. Uh, moving right along to uh, item number two, which is continued discussion of the NCOL Distracted Driving Model Act. Uh, and I'll pitch it right over to uh, Senator Bob Hackett from Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before we begin with the hearing from our panel today, I'd like to say thank you to everyone who has offered input on the model so far. Judging by the amount of comments we have received and the amount of conversations Assemblyman Cooley and I have had so far relating to the model, it is clear how this issue means so much to many people across the entire country. I know Assemblyman Cooley, fellow sponsor of the model, is, who is with us via Zoom, agrees with me in saying that the, firm, that the current first draft of the model is very strong but we are, certainly, we are certainly receptive to making some amendments to improve it. Some of those amendments have already been submitted and we thank everyone for their input. One amendment that both Assembly Cooley and I intend to include as a sponsor's amendment will be in the nature of making it clear that the model was intended, was always intended to allow for primary enforcement. Distracted driving is blatant, observable behavior which become which makes primary enforcement the best way to enforce and make clear that such behavior is not acceptable. Accordingly, primary enforcement language will be included in the next draft. And I think there'll be other sponsor amendments included as well. And I wanna make it clear, this is still a work in progress. So we, you know, we plan on working this for the next meeting and potentially the meeting after. I wanna tell people how it's going in Ohio is that we passed this legislation in Ohio a couple of years ago in the last minute in the conference committee, they switched from primary to secondary and asked law enforcement. It just can't be done. It won't work. And so we just had, we're back, the bill's back and, and uh, we just had opposition testimony and a, a set of attorneys that 
an association of attorneys that was blatantly against the uh, the bill uh, being primary now agree that it should be primary. So that's one of the things that we're getting a huge agreement about making this a primary offense. But there are other issues that we know that needs to be cleaned up and we're working on those. So I don't want to take up any more time, so I'll turn it over back over to you, Mr. Chairman. And I don't know if my fellow co-sponsor wants to say a few words because he usually is much better speaker than I am. Oh, no. Well, I will jump in, uh, See, Senator. You know, I think this issue of primary enforcement is very important. I go back to the days when California passed Prop 103, which was supposed to regulate auto insurance rates. There was a time when costs had been rising, 150% increase in the cost of auto insurance in a single decade. It changed the over the regulatory structure, but didn't actually address any cost drivers. This forced the California legislature to start going in search of things that would make for safer roads to bring down the cost of auto insurance. We did a variety of things, one of which was we started initially with a seat belt requirement, but it was secondary enforcement. It didn't provide for primary. Uh, and within just a couple of years, we realized this is a change which made people dramatically safer on the roads. And we went to a primary. And if you want affordability of auto insurance products for our constituents, you need to impinge the hazards of driving. This is exactly what this bill does. I think the primary enforcement will be a great asset. It's clearly something we, we all have the experience of driving down the road, watching the car weaving, uh, all manner of crazy things, in, including that rare occasion of someone watching a video while they're driving. Um, so very important measure. And it's a little bit technical, but it really will result in reduced loss of life, physical injury, and bring down costs of auto insurance. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, the committee is very honored to have uh, someone with a level of stature that our, our next presenter holds. Uh, the Honor Honorable Nicole Nason is the administrator of the Federal Highway Administration. Uh, that's a position that's appointed by the president, uh, confirmed by the U.S. Senate. Uh, we're, we're very uh, excited to have you here this morning and uh, look forward to hearing uh, your presentation. How about now? There we go. Thank you so much for your kind introduction, for inviting me to be with you today. I want to especially say thank you to my good friend and former colleague, uh, Commissioner Tom Considine, where he is. Um, I really appreciate the chance to come and, and speak on these important issues. And I just, by way of introduction, somewhere in the faces of Zoom is Scott Wolf, my special assistant. He is the engineer they don't let me leave without. I get along very well with my team at Federal Highways, but some of the engineers don't trust my law degree. So I do have an engineer with me if we have a specific technical question. Uh, if it helps, he's a proud Kentuckian, aren't just so you know. Uh, but those of you who are legislators, let me say thank you, uh, first off, for the work that you and all the civic leaders are doing to keep our roads safe, especially now. At FHWA, we do appreciate the challenges that you and your states are facing. We're facing many of those same challenges, the challenges of having a workforce uh, largely working from home, the 50, we say 52, different approaches and responses that each state and each local leader uh, have been taking to protect communities, and revenue and budget impacts as a result of the national public health emergency. Given the financial limitations associated with gas tax revenues and other budget shortfall areas, it's, it's getting harder to safeguard the communities that we all serve. In the last several months, I've spoken to almost all of the secretaries of transportation in, in every state. Some state departments of transportation have, been, have had to take immediate action. They've had to furlough staff and postpone highway projects, delay maintenance. Others are doing their best at least initially, to accelerate, and now they're trying to hold steady. All state DOTs have expressed budget concerns in the next six months to a year as revenue decreases will begin to clearly manifest in day-to-day -day operations. And we do understand the funding that many state DOTs face, especially with the 
now expected extension of the FAST Act, which is our current service transportation reauthorization bill. And so whatever the situation come October 1, FHWA is ready to support you and all of our partners and stakeholders, despite the fact that most of our staff, 2,700 plus strong, are teleworking. We are here to support state and local and tribal partners and communities to deliver the federal aid highway program. I truly believe that transportation, planning, construction, financing, safety, it's a team sport. We need to work together and perhaps now more than ever, federal and state and local and industry leaders need to collaborate and that will be critical to our success in delivering our transportation programs. I am very proud of the actions that the Federal Highway Administration has taken in the last few months to ensure the safety and efficiency of our roads. As just one example, when restaurants began to close or limit access, we issued a notice to temporarily allow states to permit food trucks at interstate rest areas. Some of you may know that commercial activity is normally prohibited at these areas, but unusual times call for unusual solutions. And we now find ourselves in the next phase as many communities have begun to return to normal slowly, but normal economic conditions are beginning to return. Some schools are reopening in small in-person classes. Some businesses are reopening. They're allowing more customers in. We are currently permitting states to use rights of way to socially distance restaurant tables. For those of you whose states have taken advantage of this, maybe you've seen them. Tables in the road, tables in parking spaces that we issued a blanket federal approval for this. So while we're far from being back to normal, we're definitely headed in that direction. And we may soon even see increased pressure on our highways, which I think is relevant to all of you and the work that you are doing. We know already people feel comfortable in their cars. We know that our aviation numbers are not close to back to normal, neither are transit, neither is rail, but from a a low in April, we are now back to almost 90% of where we were at this time, 2019. People feel safe in their cars. That means there'll be more people on the roads as they're reluctant currently to use other options of transportation. The safety of the traveling public will always be the top priority at the Department of Transportation. It is the top priority of Secretary Elaine Chao, and it is my top priority, and I know that you all share this focus as well since that is the topic of your discussion today. <clears throat> Despite improvements in roadway and intersection design, in work zone management, in traffic incident management, uh, even more safety features on vehicles than ever before, we still lose more than 100 people per day <clears throat> on our roads. This is unacceptable. As all of you know, there is much work left to be done to reduce fatalities and injuries on our roads. Driver distraction remains a continuing problem, and I am glad to have the opportunity to discuss it with all of you. Yours is uh, perhaps one of the most influential groups in helping to address this issue, so thank you. Over a decade ago, I led the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, NHTSA. It's a sister agency to FHWA. It has the primary responsibility within the department to reduce distracted driving, and yet, as with so many issues that we are facing right now, it's too big of an issue for one agency to handle. And it's really too big of an issue for just the federal government to handle because it's a coast to coast problem. So we need to partner with folks like you. We consider distracted driving nothing short of a national epidemic. According to NHTSA's data, nearly 23,000 people died in crashes involving a distracted diver, driver between 2012 and 2018, which is the most official data that we have right now. <laughs> uh, it's nearly 10% of all highway fatalities, and I know many people feel that the numbers are underreported. Besides the work that NHTSA does with groups like yours, they work closely with state law enforcement agencies, the academic community, and the media to ensure that drivers focus on driving. We want them to concentrate on that and to resist talking on their phone or texting or any of the other unwanted distractions out there. And distracted driving can take many forms, certainly. Putting on makeup for some of you, playing with the radio, talking on your phone, chatting with other people in the car. 
but texting has become one of the most common and pervasive forms of distracted driving. And too many drivers learn how dangerous it is too late and often at the expense of someone else's life. All of us at DOT are fighting this problem and that includes all modes of transportation. For a host of great reasons, all federal employees are prohibited from texting while driving on official business, when using a government provided personal electronic device or when using a government vehicle, whether they are on duty or not. We also require annual training for all USDOT employees on the dangers of distracted driving. And I wanna thank any and all of you who have drafted or sponsored or worked to pass uh, state bills, your commitment to safety is very much appreciated. Use of a handheld cell phone while driving is illegal in 25 states, as well as DC and Puerto Rico, Guam, which means of course, there are 25 other states that do not have such a law. So I appreciate that your organization is focusing on this continued problem. I am the daughter of a highway patrol officer. That's how I got into this field in the first place. My father drove that motorcycle up and down the Long Island Expressway looking for drunks and speeders. My whole life, we used to call him Lips because Chips was a popular TV show at the time and he was Long Island Highway Patrol, so we called him Lips, <laughs> which looking back was a terrible nickname. And so I'm, I am a, a big supporter of traffic safety enforcement. Um, we need our law enforcement partners. Just yesterday, I, I promise this is a true story, just yesterday, I was dropping my son off at school. He only goes on Wednesdays, and I don't know why uh, Wednesdays is the day the school feels is safe, but nevertheless, they go in small groups on Wednesdays, and I was driving back, and the car in front of me was moving very slowly, and it's a, it's a 25 mile per hour road, and I always appreciate when I see law enforcement out there because there are several schools in the area, and people speed on this road. This gentleman was going unnaturally slowly. And so I got in behind him and I just stayed there because I'm curious and because this is what I do for a living. And I waited as he gently swerved just a little bit, never quite out of his lane. And then sure enough, he went right up on the curb, mowed the grass for a second and bounced back down. And I thought, eyes oh, on his phone. So I drove up to look at him in the lane next to him because I'm curious and this is what I do for a living. And he's a young dad and he's got a car seat in the back. By the way, it is child passenger safety seat week. Please check your car seat. And he's on the phone and I thought, you know, he's probably working. He's working from home and he's looking at his phone. And I'm not sure until he hit that curb, he really appreciated how much danger he was in and how much danger everyone around him was in. And credit to the curb, it did its job. It scared the heck out of him. Uh, and the minute he hit it, he began to speed up again. So he was scared straight for that second. But I really do think that it's important that uh, even as we focus on enforcement, we also focus on education uh, and engineering. I do think that there are important roles for all those pieces to play when we're, when we're talking about messaging to the public how serious an issue this is. And I, I just wanted to share one last uh, anecdote. I don't know if any of you saw it, but there were two girls outside Pennsylvania who were in a terrible crash and they rolled their vehicle twice and their first instinct was to take a TikTok video you can Google this. So they filmed themselves right after the crash with a rap song and the rapper saying, what, what, what just happened? And they were mouthing the words. And the one girl held up her phone and she panned around and she filmed the windshield shattered, spider webs, and the car was on its side. So her friend was pinned against the road uh, hair sort of splayed out everywhere. And their instinct was to film a video. And they, of course, got a lot of attention for this, a lot of uh, online coverage. And as I was reading through the comments, because I'm curious and, and this is my job, uh, someone congratulated them 
and noted that he had been in a car crash himself and he was so nervous and upset after his crash that he could barely function. And, and his word to them was respect, respect to you that you had the presence of mind to film a TikTok video. And I only throw that out there as you all are discussing the legislation to just remind you that we do really need to educate. We always need to continue to educate the public and we used to say at NHTSA all the time, uh, you never finish educating parents about child safety because every day there's a new mother born when there's a new baby born. And so every time we have a new generation, we need to educate those drivers about the danger. So I, I do hope that that is something that um, is included as part of the conversations today. And again, I just want to say that I appreciate that this organization is focusing on this significant issue and thank you for inviting me to appear today and on behalf of everyone at FHWA, thank you for the role that you have played and you will continue to play to keeping our roads safe. Thank you for your time, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, um, Administrator um, Nason, for taking the time to be here today in front of the committee and, and we appreciate uh, your presentation today. Uh, next, we have um, a representative from NAMIC, I believe on Zoom. I'm not sure who is representing NAMIC today, but if you will introduce yourself and and uh, proceed with your part of the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's Andrew Kirkner on behalf of the National Association of Mutual Insurance Companies. Um, I'll be brief in my comments. Uh, NAMIC members support uh, the reduction of distracted driving, uh, and we are supportive of the in-coil model um, understanding, of course, that there are uh, additional amendments uh, and language being worked on. Um, but I guess just very briefly, we really think this is a timely effort. Uh, Ms. Nason just, just touched on something that I hadn't really considered before, um, which is, you know, it's hard to pick up a newspaper or turn on the news uh, without seeing a local city or municipality that's expanded um, the eating options for folks, whether it be on, on previously open streets or sidewalks or whatever the case might be, um, those municipalities are, are doing outreach and trying to, to help the restaurants in their area um, expand outdoor seating. Really can't think of a more uh, pertinent time to be talking about distracted driving um, with, with increased uh, areas, I guess, where, where pedestrians are. Um, you know, the, the dangers of distracted driving, I think, uh, only increase. So, um, as to the specific language, we think that the model contains some important provisions, uh, specifically uh, prohibitions on uh, streaming videos in, in some of the early days of distracted driving legislation. Um, bills focused on texting, uh, and so folks could legally be watching YouTube, uh, for example, which sounds crazy, but uh, happens. Um, and so this bill contains a prohibition against that type of action. Um, also, it's been mentioned here that there'll be a, a sponsor's amendment uh, for primary enforcement. We certainly think that's something uh, that would be uh, appropriate and strengthen this bill. So um, we're excited to work with INCOIL uh, in continuing uh, to, to form the language here. Uh, and then certainly, you know, hopefully once the, the model is adopted, excited to work with INCOIL uh, in, in implementing it in the states. So thank you for the opportunity to be here today and be a part of the discussion. Thank you, Andrew. Um, uh, next on this same topic, we have Jennifer Smith, CEO and co-founder of StopDistractions.org. Uh, is Jennifer on the Zoom? Yes, I'm here. Okay, you may proceed. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen so I can share a presentation I have for you. So, um, Thank you for having me, Mr. Chairman, and to the entire committee. Um, I'm here from StopDistractions.org. We're an organization that consists of victims, families, um, someone in their lives has been impacted by a tragedy of destructive driving. We build relationships within our communities, with law enforcement, with elected officials, and we just try to bring change to end this de deadly epidemic. 
Um, currently, where we are across the country is 24 states plus DC ha currently have hands-free laws, uh, including also, you know, Puerto Rico, Guam, US Virgin Islands. The big thing over this though, is in the last two years since 2018, we have seen a huge groundswell of laws passing. Nine states have passed this legislation in the pa these past two years, being Georgia, Minnesota, Arizona, Tennessee, Maine, Massachusetts, Virginia, Indiana, and Idaho. Um, also in 2020, um, there was another groundswell of legislation filed out of the remaining 26 states. Nearly all of them did have legislation filed. Many with states did have a very good chance of passage. Three of the states that didn't have legislation were not even in session. So that only left five states not currently working towards that legislation. And as you know, COVID hit and everything pretty much stopped in its tracks. So we expect next year to be another big year in the upcoming session. So why is this such a problem still? We've had laws on the books. Um, the big thing is the evolution of technology. We're, we how we use our phones change. So how we were writing these laws in the beginning didn't really encompass everything. You know, we all keep talking about texting, but when you talk to kids, you talk to others, they say, oh, well, I'm not texting, but they're on Instagram or they're on TikTok or they're doing something else. And again, the streaming and the data. So everything we're doing with our phones is causing this great increase in data transmissions. And that is where, you know, we need to get these laws to be more encompassing. Um, and the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety also was able to document this by looking at what drivers are doing behind the wheel. And they showed that drivers are manipulating their phones 57% more behind the wheel than did when they did in 2014. Again, it's because of all of these things we're doing with our data. Um, we also are on our phones more. And there's a new group of us emerging called what they're calling cell phone addicts. They spend actively 28% of their time ignoring the road um, this now accounts for about 8% of drivers, and that group of people is doubling every year. And I'm afraid that with COVID and with us being locked in our houses and on our devices so much, we've maybe sped that up and we could see a much bigger increase next year. So speaking of COVID, this is another issue that this is a, we really need to address distracted driving head, head on because even with less drivers on the road, I know many of you heard about speeding and crashes going up because of speeding, but also drivers were on the, their phones a lot more. Um, Zendrive telematics company looked at this data comparing one month before and one month into lockdowns. And they were showing that there was a 38% increase of driver's phone use while they're behind the wheel. Um, another thing is you all, all know this being insurance is that you know insurance rates have been constantly increasing across the country. Um, in Georgia, again, I'm gonna continue referencing them. They had seen a 12.6% increase in their insurance rates in the years before passing their hands-free law. We're seeing this normally across the country. As of a couple of years ago, it was about a 16% increase since 2011. But we're also seeing you know, the public health threat, the loss of life, the damage to the communities, our families, medical and injury costs, property damage. So all of these things working together are really increasing the public support. You know, when I, I first lost my mom in a distracted driving crash in 2008, there weren't as many families out there who had lost someone. Now, everyone pretty much knows someone who has lost their life. So this is grown that public support. And just looking at three states, an example, Tennessee, who did recently successfully pass their law, you see their polling came back at 91 support statewide. Again, it par partisan wide, it, there is bipartisan support on this. You also look at Arizona. Arizona was interesting in that they never even could pass a texting law. They had been the first state in the nation to try and had tried for 13 sessions yet never succeeded. Yet we were able to successfully get a hands-free law passed with that widespread support. And this was also after within about a two year time span, they worked on getting about 29 ordinances passed locally in order to help boost that statewide law. And then also in Michigan, we're seeing polling co coming back there, 88.3 in support. All the states that we're going into, we're seeing high 80 to low 90 support for these bills. You know, this is just, you know, so 
groundswell of support. So why do we need a handheld, hands-free bill as opposed to just these texting laws? Well, with the texting laws, there's so many gray areas. Um, people can say, I'm just texting, I'm doing this, or I was using my GPS. There was always a way for them to get out of, you know, there was a loophole. And so clearing the, these laws up, making it very clear, if the phone is in your hand, you are in violation, then that makes it much easier for law enforcement, that makes it easier to educate the public, and it really helps. So the results, this is the most important part. Um, the American Academy, Academy of Pediatrics just released a study, and they were able to conclude that bans on all handheld device use and texting bans for all drivers are associated with the greatest decrease in fatal motor vehicle crashes. If you look even further into the data, um, the Georgia Study Committee, before passing their law, they analyzed data from the 15 states that currently had hands-free laws. Uh, Representative John Carson from Georgia did this calculation and he looked at the years before and the years after. He found that 12 of the 15 states did see a 20% decrease in fatalities within two years of passing their hands-free law. And then we look even further into that and we can see in Georgia, those results are happening you know, in real time for us. So look at, looking at Georgia, Georgia had seen a 34% increase in fatal crashes from 2014 to 2016. And again, that 12.6% insurance increase. So they wanted to look at the issue to find out, you know, why is the insurance going up so much in fatalities? They concluded through that study committee that there needed to be a hands-free law passed. Um, the law did pass with a vote of 144 to 18 in the House and 52 to 1 in the Senate, and it went into effect on July 1st of 2018. The day the law went into effect, there was a 22% drop in use by drivers typing and swiping on their phones based on telematics data. I'll show you that slide next. Um, also, there was a 90 day grace period to give the public an opportunity to learn about the law. There is now a 98% awareness of the law. And as you can see, within that first year, that six month of the law being into effect, traffic fatalities were down 3.4%. Uh, there was a 15% reduction in commercial motor vehicle fatalities. This is the telematics data I mentioned. You can see before the law, the normal use, and the day the law went into effect, July 1st, you already had compliance people were getting off their phones. You see that continue to trend downwards. You see in December, another downtick. That's when the statewide enforcement efforts really kicked up. And then you see also normal fluctuations for seasonal traveling, but you see that use did not really go back up, which is why we're seeing the reductions in the fatalities and the crashes. So if we wanna look on a smaller scale of a location in Georgia, you can take one county into effect. In 2017, Cherokee County, Georgia investigated 34 fatal crashes. In 2018, when the law went into effect halfway through the year, they investigated a total of 18 crashes that year. And in 2019, with that hands-free law in effect all year, they investigated only nine fatal crashes. Um, overall, Georgia, since 2018, we are seeing even greater significant declines. Um, as of 18 months into the law, there was a Fatalities down 7% in the state, again, after a 34% increase. We're seeing vulnerable road users in even greater savings. Bicyclist fatalities down 30%, pedestrians 11%, ages 15 to 24 and 25 to 65, 10 and 11%. Intersection and lane departure crashes also down 10 and 12%. Um, looking at some other states that have recently enacted laws to see this pattern is continuing, continuing that Georgia wasn't just a, you know, a one-off. In Minnesota, their law went into effect on August 1st of 2019. And comparing their fatalities, um, driving fatalities for distracted driving were down 2% and overall down 4.6% within that first small period. And then we can also, and you can also look at the citations. It is for all ages that are being cited in these. It's not just the teens, it's all of us that are using our phones. And the last state I'll cover is Tennessee. Tennessee also passed their law, which went into effect on July 1st. Um, I was able to pull their data as of February 21st as the last data I pulled before COVID really hit. Um, you can see distracted driving crashes year over year were down about 3.84%. 2020 year to date as of February 21st, fatalities were down 9.6% and crashes overall were down 4.1%. So again, we're seeing these results in numerous states. A common question that comes up 
it doesn't cost constituents any additional money to comply with this. A lot of time my constituents don't have Bluetooth, they don't have this. Um, any smartphone, you can download an app to make your phone work with voice activation for free. If you do wanna require a mount to be used um, for compliance, then those mounts now can be found anywhere from one to $5. There are many economical options that can help. Um, again, this is just covering again, the texting laws as they are, are pretty much unenforceable. We need a clear law. The phone is in your hand, you're in violation. And then another question is law enforcement. How will they enforce this if they couldn't enforce it before? They do have training developed for them. Um, International Association of Chiefs Police just developed a, a specific training package, as well as the Traffic Safety Institute from NHTSA DOT has some virtual training. But again, these are laws that have been being enforced and protected for the last decade. So they are pretty much easily enforced. If we have that clear law, the phone's in your hand, you're in violation. And then the key points for support, again, current laws, there's not opposition. Um, broad coalitions are supporting these. You know, The data is showing that these laws both sites lives. And with that, I am completed my com presentation. Thank you, Jennifer, uh, very much for your uh, detailed presentation today. Um, and I, I don't know if I announced this earlier, but we are not planning on a vote today. This is just discussion only. Uh, as we, we move forward, uh, hopefully with, uh, with a bill that we can act on uh, at the uh, annual meeting in December, I think is the, if that's the wishes of the sponsors. Um, we have two more presenters on this topic, so we'll try to move through them because we have a couple more agenda items uh, following that. Uh, next, uh, we have Bree uh, Jezinek, uh, the PNC Product Development uh, with PNC Product Development with Nationwide. Uh, Bree, if you're on there, you may introduce yourself and go ahead with your part of the presentation. Hi, thank you. Just let everyone know, can everyone see my slide deck? No, yeah. your slide, slide's not up yet. Give me just one second here, thank you. We can see you now. Okay, now we can see it. You see it? Okay, great. Thank you, Chairman Rowland and members of the Uncoil Property and Casualty Committee for inviting me to speak to the Uncoiled Distracted Driving Model Act. Thank you, Senator Hackett and Assemblyman Cooley for sponsoring this model act and for your leadership on this important issue. My name is Bree Jesnick. I lead Nationwide's distracted driving efforts through our PNC product and telematics teams. I'm pleased to appear here today on behalf of Nationwide to provide some insights related to distracted driving and the innovative ways Nationwide is working to combat handheld distraction through the use of telematics. Uh, personally, as a mother of a high schooler who is about to get his license, I want to do everything in my power to make sure he is safe and protected when he gets behind the wheel without me. I worry that the combination of phone distractions and inexperienced driving will create a dangerous and potentially deadly recipe. And without me sitting in the passenger seat, will he make the right choice? Or will he fear feel pressured to respond to text messages and send Snapchats to his friends? Will I have the help of law enforcement when I cannot be there? In February of this year, our CEO, Kurt Walker, published an article titled, Hands-Free Laws Would Make Roads Safer. This public call to action aligns with our belief as a mutual insurance company that exists to serve and protect its members. That now is the time to bring consistency to roadways across the country. We are committed to reducing distracted driving through heightened public awareness, development of technology to mitigate risks, continued targeted research, and the enactment and enforcement of hands-free laws that ban texting and handheld cell phone use while driving. As Jennifer stated, we know that states that implemented hands-free legislation experienced an average 15.3% decrease in fatality rates within two years after their laws were enacted. That's a number I can get behind. As a leading provider of auto insurance across this country, Nationwide strongly supports and applauds Uncoil's efforts to adopt this model act. We need to create a mindset where distracted driving is viewed just as culturally unacceptable and undesirable as driving under the influence of drugs or alcohol. A combination of education, public awareness, and public policy will help bring about this mindset. 
In addition to supporting efforts to curb distracted driving around the country, Nationwide is working to raise awareness by providing in-app distraction feedback and tips on how to become a safer driver through our telematics mobile program, SmartRide. Our SmartRide mobile discount program provides an opportunity for our members to save money while becoming safer drivers. Operating system sensor data is captured to provide our customers insights into their phone use behind the wheel. And by doing so, we can elevate our call to action to eliminate active phone use and create safer roadways for drivers, passengers, and pedestrians in all communities. Safety advocates will tell you, as said, that distracted driving crashes and fatalities are underreported. And this is exactly what we are seeing through our partnership with Cambridge Mobile Telematics, who is currently the largest mobile telematics provider in the industry. While NHTSA estimates that 4.2% of drivers are distracted at any given time between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., we know based on CMT's data that 41% of car trips between those hours in 2019 involved significant cell phone distractions. That figure was 26% in 2017, representing a substantial increase in just two years. So let's think about what that means as you could also say that roughly four out of 10 cars passing you, a family member or a friend was involved in a significant cell phone distraction. And as we are all aware, all it takes is one vehicle to change someone's life forever. Additionally, CMT's analysis of crash data determined that 19% of crashes were attributable to phone-based distraction. Reducing active distraction will have a significant impact on accidents and could help to save lives. Starting in January 2017, CMT has recorded and analyzed 54 million trips across the US. In 2019, that data showed 37% of all trips involved significant driver phone distraction. And that number is trending upwards. In 2018, the national average was 35. But in some states, their analysis showed more than 50% of trips involved significant phone distraction. These numbers confirm what we all see on the road on a daily basis, and it is only getting worse. The increased prevalence of smartphone technology has accompanied an increase in active distraction and all road users are impacted. You, me, our family and friends. A CMT analysis of road fatalities and injuries in the US shows a direct correlation between the increase in owned smartphones and fatalities. The current pandemic has only increased society's reliance on technology and while vehicle miles driven have decreased in 2020, the National Safety Council announced that motor vehicle deaths were up 20% in the first six months of the year. And this is frightening. We need to move swiftly to protect futures. Smartphone ownership and use in the US are at a record high and data analysis from CMT shows that by 2025, 4,000 people per year will lose their life from smartphone distraction related crashes. By that time, half a million crashes will have associated directly with smartphone distraction, and we cannot allow this to happen. In my home state of Ohio, the governor recently called for passage of a distracted driving bill similar to your model after it was reported that July was the deadliest month on Ohio's roadways since 2007. We believe that drivers should have their eyes on the roadways instead of emailing, texting, shopping, posting, liking, viewing, watching, or any other distraction caused by holding a cell phone. As a company committed to protecting people, businesses, and futures with extraordinary care, we're looking forward to continuing to work with you, our members and officials across the country to raise awareness and to advocate for change to keep all eyes on the road and both hands on the wheel. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bree, um, for that presentation also. <clears throat> our last presenter on this topic uh, is Analia Mickelman, Senior Legislative Attorney with the American Medical Association. Uh, and if you're on the Zoom call, uh, you can introduce yourself and, and uh, begin your presentation. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Analia Michaelman. Um, as said, I'm a Senior Legislative Attorney at the American Medical Association, um, and I'm very pleased to be with you here today virtually. Thank you for having me. Um, on behalf of the AMA and our physician and medical student members, I'd like to thank NCOIL and this committee for your focus on the important issue of distracted driving. 
Um, the AMA takes the problem of distracted driving very seriously. We consider it a wholly preventable public health hazard. Um, the use of a handheld wireless communication device is a leading source of distraction for drivers, as you all know. Uh, the act of composing, sending, reading messages, photos, videos, or anything else um, interrupts drivers' cognitive attention, causes vision to be directed away from the road, and compromises manual control of the vehicle. Um, at the AMA, we encourage our physicians to educate their patients about the public health risks of using a handheld device while operating a motor vehicle, and we advocate for state legislation prohibiting the use of such devices while driving. Um, the AMA, in fact, has its own model legislation on the matter. Um, the AMA Distracted Driving Reduction Act mirrors the committee's draft model act in many ways, um, and we would like to convey our support for your model act and appreciation um, for the draft. Um, legislation to prohibit use of a handheld wireless device while driving is absolutely vital to improving roadway safety, safety for motor vehicle drivers, as well as passengers, bicyclists, pedestrians, and other road users. Um, the one suggestion we would like to make uh, is that we encourage the committee to include an exception for a physician or other healthcare professional acting within the course and scope of their employment. Um, these professionals do mm -hmm. not necessarily fall into the definition of an emergency medical service personnel, uh, which is included in your draft. Um, but our physician members often uh, must use the handheld device to respond to an urgent medical matter remotely while they are in transit to a healthcare facility to respond in person. Um, of course, it is important that physicians and others uh, take all safety measures um, available to avoid handheld use, such as turning on hands-free mode. Um, but sometimes, as is the case with other first responders, handheld use is simply unavoidable. Um, and we appreciate your consideration of our perspective on this. Um, so I would like to just reiterate that the AMA appreciates the, this committee's attention to this important public safety issue. Um, we support the draft model legislation on distracted driving, um, and we're looking forward to working with you to enact this legislation across the country to save lives. Um, thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you, and thank you for uh, taking time to, um, to speak to us today. Um, real quickly, we'll ask uh, members of the committee if um, they have comments or questions. I think Senator Rapert does. Thank you very much. I, I definitely appreciate everybody for being here. And actually, um, it reminded me, it's been a few years, but uh, NHTSA had me come in a few years ago um, on the drowsy driving issue. Uh, Maggie's Law in New Jersey, uh, where Commissioner Considine and our staff hail from, we followed up in Arkansas with a bill on the matter and was asked to come in and present on that. And so I, I absolutely support the concepts that we're talking about here definitely support the, the direction we're going. Um, I, I wanted to ask though, I think it, this may have gotten, I don't know if it would be the sponsor or somebody that's presenting here, but uh, the maps, you know, the issue, there's kind of two issues there. Uh, everybody likes a map function. I mean, how in the world did we get around before <laughs> GPS? And so obviously these are screens that are showing here. And so, to be intellectually honest about it, I don't know how much difference there is looking over at that than there is a video plan. Um, I can tell you the difference, obviously, between the two, one's for fun, the other one's to know where you're going, but obviously you're looking at that screen, okay, back and forth. And the other one is, and again, I kept looking in here and there may have been an exemption because I'm gonna say that probably a lot of this gets down to an investigation of what was going on on that phone, especially if there's a death involved or something and they're looking at that. So I know for me, um, a lot of content that I like to listen to, it's not on the radio. And a lot of it is old archive video. And so I'll just turn that on when I'm going down the road and it's playing, I'm not watching the video but I'm listening to that. So I just wonder uh, how deep, you know, because we're actually getting very specific in the language. So these are just things, again, it's not at all critical of the fact of what we're trying to do, but it is just, you know, very, very apparent that those are things that, you know, how do we, how are we going to handle that? So I don't know if anybody's got a response. Uh, maybe we can research it and bring it back up later, but that's, that's a couple things I wondered about and if anybody has any kind of insight. So, Senator Hackett. Just, you know, response, and I, I have a question too. I, 
I think when, you know, one of the things we have found, Simply McCooley can speak also, but from the manufacturers and the association is the equipment is really getting better and better and better to protect against this. And so one of the things, if you watch the systems that are put in the car, they're getting louder, they're getting to the point that people want to be told what to do, et cetera, without visually looking at things, et cetera. So they're really trying with the, the new cars coming out. I don't know if you'd like to answer that also, but what would your response to that be? I know I don't have to put you on the spot. No, that's all right. I I appreciate it, uh, Senator. I wouldn't let you put me on the spot. I cannot officially comment on behalf of the administration. Um, but I can say that these issues surrounding privacy and advancement of new technologies are ones that we hear all the time at the department, especially as handheld devices become more and more sophisticated, but also the vehicle becomes more sophisticated. It's one of the reasons why we stress all three pieces of the stool, which is why in my uh, remarks, I tried to stress the importance of education, enforcement and education, and then the improvements in new technology can work against us, but they can also work for, for us. us right. And that is something that I think we have looked at inside that NHTSA has looked at and um, Federal Highways and all of the other agencies at the department. How do we have the technology work with us? We don't need to be uh, at war with it necessarily. There could be places where uh, it can help. It can shut off. It can discontinue. People have the option now, I think, in many cases to turn off. And in some cases, it will shut off automatically. So I do think there are ways um, to approach the industry to talk about some of these issues without, without only focusing on the one leg of the stool. Thank you. Um, Assemblyman Cahill has a comment or a question. Thank you. Uh, uh, th three points, basically, that I'd like to delve into a little bit, and, and I will put them all out there and then let any of the panelists respond as they see fit. Uh, the first one is a number of statistics were cited, and uh, um, in some instances, the uh, entity that developed those statistics was also cited. What was not really developed was the methodology used to arrive at those statistics. <coughs> know a little bit more about that. Um, the second question is about uh, in uh, drilling down into those statistics, does the methodology of the distraction, does the mode of the distraction make a difference um, in terms of uh, how much it puts uh, the motoring public at risk? And um, the, the third is more an editorial point than it is a, a, a question. Um, the American Medical Association witness um, sought exemptions for people uh, in the medical profession. Um, I, I have to tell you that I see a lot of people who are exempt from the existing laws in my state, and they're not using them for emergency purposes. They're using them because they don't have to pay attention to the law while the rest of us do and should, and they are as distracted as any other driver. Um, would the medical society accept something more akin to an affirmative defense as opposed to an exemption so that if someone were to establish that they were in fact on an emergency call, um, that would be uh, one that they could be forgiven for putting us all at risk. Um, the last thing I'll say is that the Griffith Institute several years ago did a distracted driving program for legislators at lunchtime and it was the most enlightening uh, all due respect to every other program I've been here for, the most enlightening program I've ever participated at NCOIL. Um, it established firmly in my mind that humans are not actually capable of multitasking. We can only monotask in series. And uh, we, we really do have a very easy tendency to lose our focus on, on the most important task in front of us if we allow something else to, to take over. So. First, the statistics cited, what was the methodology used? The second is, the, what, does the mode of distraction make a difference? And the third is a, a affirmative defense versus exceptions. Thank you, Wood. Uh, any of our presenters like to tackle the, the uh, questions from Assemblyman Cahill? Um, 
Well, this is Jennifer Smith. On any statistics I cited, there's a PowerPoint that was not sharing correctly. So um, that PowerPoint can be looked at. And what we did um, was just looked at the fatality numbers of crashes and you know, comparing year to year of fatality crashes. And then within their numbers, it was their state DOTs that did the analysis of their distracted driving crashes per se. So I could get additional information that would get you more detailed methodologies on those things. And, and members should note that the slides that uh, Jennifer was trying to share are on the app and on the website and everyone uh, can look at those at your leisure. Um, Would the representative from the American Medical Association want to address um, the medical exemption question if you're still with us? I am still here. Um, I think the idea of an affirmative defense makes sense. Um, physicians en route to a hospital aren't identifiable as such um, when they're driving their cars. They're not, you know, in an ambulance or something like that. Um, so I think that they would be pulled over um, if, for being on their phone or whatever it may be. Um, so they would already kind of be in the situation where there might be a citation. Um, so I'd be happy to continue this conversation, maybe talk with some of my, some of my physician members about what um, uh, alternatives might make sense. Um, but right off, you know, top of my mind, I think an affirmative defense um, is reasonable. I would Thank just you. add that similar to what Jennifer said, the statistics that I shared through our partnership with CMT, Cambridge Mobile Telematics, um, is all in direct correlation to phone use and crash data through their analysis. All right, uh, thank you. Last question on this topic um, will be Representative Oliverson and then we'll move on to the rest of the agenda. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I would just say um, more of a comment, you know, in Texas, we have a program, I, I think it's, it's an app, it's actually grown way outside of our state now, it's called Safe to Save. Uh, and it's very popular uh, with the, you know, the high school, college age crowd, you basically put it on your phone uh, and it uses the telematics data to figure out when you're driving. And as long as you're not touching your phone while you're driving, you're earning points that can be used as discounts at restaurants and shops and they built quite an extensive network. And so, you know, I, I think the other, my point in bringing this up is that, you know, there's a carrot uh, as well as a stick uh, method of solving this problem that we need to be looking for solutions as well. Thank you. <clears throat> and I'll give uh, the last comments to the sponsor, Senator Hackett. Yeah, I just want, and, and, and I agree with you a thousand percent on education is so important. I mean, at our last uh, at our hearing on the opposition hearing, public defenders testified, and their big issue was, you know, what's the intent? And when you talk to the people who've been into these crashes, et cetera, they'll say, oh my God, I would have never, I would never have thought that. And look how we've learned from alcohol, from DUIs. I mean, now people who drink too much, they know they're breaking the law. I mean, they're, so they choose to break the law and the intent is there. And so I think we, we, we have to have a combination. If you look at our bill, our bill basically leaves it up to the individual states to create the actual, we have some dollar penalties, but whether it's a felony or a misdemeanor, we're really actually leaving it up to the individual states because there's a lot of people that you can go, in Ohio, felony one, two, and three, you go to jail. And so, you know, these people said, I had no idea, I had no idea. And so I think, you're right in that we have to educate people, but we also learn from the past. Look how we've been successful in DUIs and the numbers have come down, but part of it was because we hammered them on that scenario. So I don't know what the solution will be in a situation like this, but man, you know, people just aren't responsible. They just don't realize, and their intent is not there. I mean, if you ask every public defender will tell you every case they have on distracted driving, not one person, they couldn't find one, in Ohio where the person said, man, you know, I had no idea, I was doing this. And I, you know, they just don't realize the ramifications because they've been doing it a long time. They've been on their phone a long time, maybe different types of phones that have been doing it. So I, I don't know what the solution is. I think you're right. I think if we can educate and get it out with the combinations of what 
my friend from Texas said that we can put the stick in a carrot. That, I think that's a great idea. But that's a, it's a tough scenario, you know, to, to be able to get this done right. It really is. I, I just and if I may jump in, Mr. Chair, Ken Cooley. Yeah, uh, yes, sir. Uh, you know, I think the testimony is that we have this activity that people have engaged in for a long, long time, driving a motor vehicle. Technology has made it subject to this sort of creeping recklessness. The phones get smarter, there's more capabilities, it's hard to set them down. People don't set out to be reckless, but that is the net effect. There's a dramatic level of activity happening in the driver's seat beyond what was the case five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. So you sort of need to confront it. I think the technology is improving things. The map function is excellent, but most of the map functions will provide verbal audio directions. Once you program it, it'll it'll tell you when to, when to do things. You don't necessarily need to handle the phone. I think the virtue of a model actually in COIL, we pass a model, it starts showing up around the country. That actually gives very clear signals to the uh, technology companies, the designers of phones. It sort of lets them understand where they want to be designing their products uh, to anticipate the state of the law during the service life of that product they're designing now. So I actually think this is the type of area where a clear model law that gains national support that is seen as saving lives will be a very important signal to manufacturers. So it's a, um, somewhat unique from some of our models. Uh, all of our models kind of say, what is the best path? But this will actually, I think, shape capital investment and innovation uh, in a more safe manner and to start to confront this sort of creeping recklessness. Uh, but I think the conversation is extremely important on all sides to understand how to make this, um, how to make it a transition people feel is constructive. But you know, it will start translating into lower insurance premiums pronto, just like the seatbelt laws have done in most of our states. Thank you. Ms. Nason, did you have final comments you wanted to make? Yes, thank you, Representative. I just, um, I want to say thank you again to all of you for allowing me to be here today. And I hope that although I'm not able to comment officially, that it does convey that the Department of Transportation is interested in, in working with you on these important issues. I did, uh, Senator, spend several years on the National Board of Directors of Mothers Against Drunk Driving. And I spoke at their 25th anniversary and of course, when Mothers Against Drunk Driving first started, it was a joke. Johnny Carson told jokes about how drunk people were in their cars the night before. And so it was that combination of passing laws and then enforcing those laws, but also educating the public. And then we looked at new technologies like breathalyzers. So I do think there's a terrific model there. And I really just want to commend you for your uh, commitment to road safety. And thank you for allowing me to be here. Yeah, thank you. And, and thank you to all the presenters and discussion on this. We'll continue the discussion. Um, at the next meeting in Tampa. Uh, and when the sponsors feel the time is right uh, and we, the committee has the support, we'll hopefully pass a, pass a model law. Um, we'll move on. We have two more agenda items. So we'll move on to the, to the agenda item number three, uh, which is the discussion of the future of transportation and impacts on the property and casualty industry. Uh, our presenter is Robin Chase, uh, co-founder and former CEO of Zipcar, founder and former CEO of Buzzcar. Um, and uh, Robin, if you're on, on the yeah. call, if you would uh, introduce yourself and proceed. We have, we probably have about uh, 15 minutes, uh, which will give us just about five minutes for that last agenda item uh, before we run up on our six o'clock um, committee deadline. So if you're on here, introduce yourself and please proceed. Okay, hi, I'm Robin Chase. That was a totally fascinating conversation. I'm delighted to have heard it. And I'm going to move quickly. Let me just share my screen and we will go. So I have, I have founded a lot of new mobility companies and every time I have done them, so I founded Zipcar, first car, large car sharing company in America in 2000. Um, I've done peer-to-peer -peer car sharing, I've done ride sharing, 
And each time insurance has been a huge issue for us. And I have never operated without insurance and getting that insurance has sometimes taken as much as three years to get insurance before I could launch the company. So I wanted to give you some thoughts about this. And I hope this is kind of like dessert or something uh, different and less uh, fun for you to think about at the end of the day here. So policy insurance regulation needs to build on solid ground. Way back in 2000, um, when I created Zipcar, when I co-founded Zipcar, the questions for insurers was, is this a fleet? But, you, but we don't control the users of this fleet are not employees. And so they couldn't think of it like that because we don't, the members aren't employees. From a state standpoint, was it car rental? In Boston, where we launched, had recently put up a law that was a $10 surcharge on every car rental in order to pay for their new convention center. And I know when they made that law, they said, oh, these are out of towners who are renting cars, it's great. But Zipcar and car sharing is used by people in the neighborhood instead of owning their own car and is by the hour and by the day. So a one hour transaction, one hour, one hour car rental, if we were car rental, if we were car rental, a one hour rental of a zip car would then incur a $10 charge, which would double the cost of that one hour. Then there's a whole issue, should we be getting commercial or personal plates? And if we got commercial plates, were we allowed to park in loading zones or were we not allowed to park in lo loading zones? Then there was this issue in when we moved to Washington DC, um, for every retail entity in the city, there was some $300 a year fee. And they, thought, they said, okay, are zip cars retail entities? And then another, in another location, um, it was a residential neighborhood, residentially zoned, and people, some people were saying, oh, well, you can't have these cars in, rentally, in residentially zoned neighborhoods because they are commercial. Yet, Zipcar is actually used, as I'm saying, by people who live everywhere around you instead of their own cars. So they should exist and get the same treatment in all ways as personal cars. But just to say it caused a huge amount of anxiety among both the insurers, as I say, it took me years to get the insurance and in the policymakers um, at the, both the local and the state level. Um, then I wanna move forward in time. In 2007, Velib, which was probably the first very large bike sharing company, bike sharing effort in the world in Paris. When they went onto these Paris streets, there was a huge issue where people are saying, why is the city giving space so much space to this public to this private company and oh so you're calling shared bikes public transportation and so that's why you're saying you're going to put stored in public spaces but what if it's owned by a pri private company and is my personal bike as good as public transportation and who are there age limits to who gets to ride them even though with personal bikes there is no age limits and who gets the liability it was another huge issue because no one had ever thought of shared bikes on mass before then we can go to, which you guys I know have discussed, in 2012, in 2012, Uber and Lyft started to get going. And they claimed that they weren't taxis. When in reality, we know, we all know they are taxis. They absolutely are taxis. But the issue was, again, it's been, now it's been 10 years, even eight years that we've been going through this. Are drivers employees or are they not employees? Are the vehicles which are personal vehicles, do they need to undergo all the laws that we put onto taxis? Do they have special types of, of inspections? And what about insurance? When I'm driving my own car and it's my own purpose, it's on my own insurance, but when I'm using it in a commercial way, it now has to trigger onto the other, onto another, onto a private commercial insurance. And then there's this, what drove me crazy is for the first three years they were operating, they completely lied about whether the insurance industry was covering them and whether your personal policy would cover. So every chance I can get, I can tell you in the press, I would constantly point out they were lying and um, your personal insurance was not covering that. And so we did have a car accident in um, San Francisco, I think, where the person who had been driving ran someone over in a crosswalk. And the question was, were they had the app, was the app turned on or was the app not turned on? And so just to say, as you all know, there's been so much roiling and so much thought going into what is the right policy recommendations and what is the right, how do we do this insurance? 
Let me fast forward to 2017, the whole rise of e-scooters. Are they safe? What are the rules around them? And I just, um, I had to laugh at these um, tweets. So the thing on the left is banned for safety. The thing on the right is not. And then another piece was every single time there was, there was discussions around the safety of scooters, there never was discussions around the huge number of very large SUVs and their grills. And so you look at that big thing and I just love this comment, but e-scooters, they're so dangerous. And as we know, and as we just heard that this 33% of motor vehicle fatalities are the people outside the vehicle. And so when we look at those e-scooter accidents, who is actually hitting them? Very, very few are self-induced. It's cars that are hitting and killing these people. And as we just went through the rise in pedestrian and cyclist fatalities is enormous. And part of it, a good piece is attributed to distracted driving. And another good piece of it is attributed to the large number of SUVs on our roads that when they hit pedestrians um, and cyclists, there are fatalities. So just again, to say that this whole brand new mobility service arrived and we had to go through this drama, what's gonna happen. And what is going to happen next in the year 2020 what? When we're gonna have autonomous vehicles and we know that there's a very strong push to rent out your own personal autonomous vehicle. Is that gonna be considered a taxi? Will it be under taxi laws or will it be under the laws, special new side silo that we created for Uber and Lyft, the TNC laws? Is it considered public transit and a public good if we fill it and there's four people in it? And if it's just one person, do we not think it's a public good and do we think it's not doing good things for the public? It's going to introduce this huge new issue of is it commercial personal, personal? What's the toggle? How do we know? So um, about two years ago, as I was trying, as I, I fly around the world and I do a lot of recommending to uh, state national governments on transportation policy, particularly urban transportation policy and talk with a lot of these companies. Um, we, in, we created with 10 large NGOs that work in the city and transportation on an international basis, these things called the shared mobility principles for livable cities. And the idea was to get an alignment between all the stakeholders, so the, the city governments, the service providers and individuals, and what are, are is there a, a joint vision as to where we should be moving forward? And under NUMO, um, we created something that I'm about to have my colleague talk about. Um, coming to this assessment of all this new mobility and what do we, how do we legislate for it and how do we insurance ensure it? What I realize is we need to get down to the foundation of risks and foundation of public benefit. And we have spent the last hundred years building these silos. And so we said, okay, here's what's called a bicycle. Here are the rules for bicycle. Here's what's called a taxi. Here are the rules for taxi. Here's what's called a personal car and the rules for personal cars. Here's the rules for tux, trucks. And what we know is those silos have been completely obliterated and are going to be increasingly obliterated. So as I say, for Zipcar, it was just the most annoying thing. Is this a personal car or car rental or what is it? And, and I just went through these things, we don't have time. So we have to not think in these silos. We have to think out of vehicle type silos and go to these risk profile silos. When I'm thinking of policy and risk, I wanna know what is the footprint of this vehicle? What is the weight? What is the speed? These are the key issues. What are the emissions? So we have this different way, different framing. Um, I'm going to introduce my colleague, Carlos Pardo, who is my colleague. And Carlos, I'm going to let you, Carl, um, who works with me at NUMO. And Carlos, you take this on. Thank you, Robin. So, so as Robin was saying, we can use um, basically an analogy with the periodic table uh, that we know from chemistry, which was the evolution of alchemy and, and probably what we are in right now is the alchemy of transportation. And what we wanted to find was a way to start to identify those attributes of vehicles and then how can we start finding something which is much more clear in terms of these very minute differences. And these are only 12 vehicles that already exist today, which we could start organizing uh, in, in, in a way in terms of their weight, their speed, and their emissions. And, and what we are working on now 
is actually a much more detailed tool that can help us in identifying these characteristics and then should i am, am i that's I fine playing this okay it's fine go yeah leave it there and then i'll explain how it works so basically what we have is we have 40 something vehicles in this platform and we can choose based on the characteristics or the attributes of a vehicle even if it's something fantastic like a dragon and whether it's being used for commercial or personal use then we can start identifying clearly with a series of algorithms uh, what would be the risk assessment that is related to that vehicle what would be the driver's license that it would need what would be the data requirements the operator license whether it needs a subsidy or not so we've we've done a lot of work in really getting into the details and into the weeds of this. And we have started to even link this to whether a vehicle can be used or not in a segment of a street near the curb, far from the curb, and what are the rules associated to that. So that's what we're working on. And then what we would, what we have today until now, uh, um, which is now the next slide, is we have more than 40 vehicles into this platform. We can integrate as many as we want. We have these algorithms that I was mentioning to start to identify which are the recommendations that we could provide. And that is linked to policy recommendations for the, the different policies that I was describing. And all of this is based on an overarching risk assessment. Now, what we want to do and, and the way forward for this tool, which is the next that I'd like to, to talk about is we want to improve the usability of this platform. We want to improve the reporting, get data from cities, start linking this to other efforts, both in curbside management, with the service providers, with the legislators, with uh, companies related to insurance, and then start integrating this tool into what they are doing in terms of risk assessment, in terms of the curbside management, so that we can start understanding and addressing these, these very siloed ways of, of learning and acting upon uh, transportation. And then we're very happy to, to follow up on any interest that you have either in taking part in this initiative, which is completely uh, open source and voluntary and is free for anyone to continue using. And some of the resources that, of other things that we are working on from NUMO are listed here. And then I'll, I'll let Robin close for us. Um, I, I'm looking at the time and I don't know if there's any time for Q&A, but I guess the bottom line is you guys should recognize that we are moving and have been for the last 20 years, increasingly moving away from these very siloed defined vehicle types because we have so much technology in so many different ways to slice, slice things. And this ability to share in many different ways is just completely transforming the, the game. And we will see even more of that. And so we would recommend that really, and, and for me, from the perspective of getting insurance for new vehicles or for figuring out what the licensing requirements are in states is to have policy, policies written and regulations written on the basis of these key risk things. So is it, you know, what is, what is its weight? What is its speeds? What are its emissions? And how, are you going, how many people are you going to impact? Is it commercial use or personal use? And that would make all future things much simpler. They would just look at the table, know how they fit in and go. So I'll stop sharing. And I don't know if you have any questions. <clears throat> Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Carlos, uh, for your presentation. Do uh, any of the members of the committee have any questions for them at this time? If not, thank you again uh, for your presentation uh, and uh, look forward to hearing from you again in the future. Um, we'll move uh, quickly on to our final uh, agenda item, which is agenda item number four, and that's the readoption of the model laws that we discussed uh, at the July 24th uh, interim uh, Zoom committee meeting. Um, there were five laws that we discussed that day. We, we the, the point of the interim committee meeting was that we could avoid potentially a discussion uh, today. We will do all the discussion and, and hear comments from interested parties and legislators uh, in the interim committee. And today the committee would just simply take a vote. So uh, the five um, model laws that are up for readoption are uh, Post-Assessment Property and Liability Insurance Guarantee Association Model Act, the Model Act regarding Medicaid interception of insurance payments, 
the Storm Chaser Consumer Protection Act, uh, the Model Act regarding use of credit information and personal insurance, and the Model Act to regulate insurance requirements for transportation network companies and transportation network drivers. Uh, I would entertain a motion at this time to readopt Representative Alverson, second by Representative Shamore. Um, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 And the motion does carry. We have readopted the five uh, model bills. Um, Gotcha. Um, and then our final uh, agenda item, uh, any other business? Um, Representative Lehman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have one piece of other business I would like to uh, take care of. Um, with the passage of the uh, uh, flood insurance issue today, um, uh, there is a, uh, that was, that, that committee was formed for that purpose. So that committee will no longer exist. We're going to sunset that committee. Um, and I would propose, and I would like to appoint as president, uh, uh, Senator Vicki Sawyer as the vice chair of this committee, which has a vacancy right now. So that would be one thing I'm going to be changing, uh, is the sunsetting of the committee and, and appointing Senator Sawyer as your vice chair. Smaller government. We like it. Uh, any other business to come before the committee? If not, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. That will be adjourned? Yes. That was a cinnamon coolie. Oh, okay. All right, have a motion.